All right. Thank you for coming to our meeting. I was I was hoping to fill all the seats in here, but you know I'm a real optimist, so what can I say? Our program tonight is John Wilson, who is president of Kansas Action for Children. And I'm hoping some of you have heard of this organization in the past. Um, I got acquainted it, with it when uh, Annie McKay was their leader. I don't, John, did you know Annie at all? Yep, I did. Uh, I was vice president. Uh, Annie, Annie recruited me to the organization. I see. Well, we're very pleased to have you this evening to enlighten us about all the issues that we should be paying attention to to make it a better environment for our children. Thank you for coming. Of course. Yeah, so I, I have to ask, is my head on a giant screen? Uh, so am I, like a, am I a big talking head in the auditorium? Maybe. I think things just went mute. Enormous. Can you there hear us now? Now I can hear you. Yes. Okay. So I think we have to leave a, a, a microphone on. So. Okay. Talk now and see how that works. All right. How about that? Can everybody hear? Okay. Great. And I am a confirmed. I'm an enormous talking head. Yes. <laughs> okay. Good. Great. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to make the most of being a talking head today. Um, I am really glad to be visiting with you all, and as I mentioned in the chat box, I um, I, I would gladly be there uh, if my day were slightly less hectic. But I started at 6 a.m. with a meeting with the current Speaker of the House, Dan Hawkins, and have just had a series of meetings since then, and so it was just wasn't possible to get over there. But um, uh, next time, I hope you'll have me. So I think uh, over the next 30 minutes or so, I wanted to cover a couple of things. Uh, first, I wanted to visit about what Kansas Action for Children does, who we are, who we serve, how we work. And then I wanted to share a little bit about what we're seeing uh, this session, what we've already seen and what we anticipate seeing. And it's going to all be through the lens of its impact on children and families. And then want to leave ample time for questions and, and uh, discussion and because I prefer kind of interactive conversation as opposed to being a giant talking head on a screen. So um, if you have questions along the way that, that just really need to be blurted out, you can let me know. I can see people from a distance and you can wave, but otherwise just, uh, just mention something. Um, so I wanna start first uh, with, I'll start very personal and talk about myself and then I'll move into Kansas Action for Children. And I don't normally, uh, talk about myself too much, but I think it's relevant to the, this conversation. So I have been the president and CEO of Kansas Action for Children since uh, 2019. But prior to that, I was vice president. And prior to that, I actually served in the Kansas legislature. I was uh, a, a member of the House, and I represented southeastern Douglas County and southeastern Lawrence. Um, so I, I was elected in 12 and served from 13 until I stepped down in 17. Um, and that was the year, actually, that we uh, collectively, uh, by Republicans and Democrats came together together to overturn the Brownback tax disaster. Uh, so I have I've now experienced policymaking from all sides. I've been a, a candidate running for office once unsuccessfully, the other times successfully. I've been uh, an elected representative, and now on the other side, I'm uh, working the nonprofit advocacy space. And I have to say that I personally like the nonprofit advocacy space the best because. Uh, it has a, a healthy amount of politics involved because you have to factor in politics and policy making, but you don't have to be hyper partisan and political. And that means I can work with whoever wants to do good things for kids and families. Uh, so my, my background though, isn't in public policy or in political science or anything like that. I actually have a bachelor of fine arts in graphic design. And so uh, I often am asked why, why this, why are you doing this? And, and for me, it's because uh, design is about attention to detail, problem solving, communication of an, of an idea and empathy. And I just happen to like to apply those uh, principles to social and political problems more than visual problems. And I, and in terms of what drives me, I think I'm very motivated by um, 
uh, children's issues and making sure that that all all young people in Kansas have the best opportunity and uh, the best start at life possible. And I also like to help Kansans understand the systems and, and policies that shape their lives and help them find out how to use their voice and their votes to influence those systems. So I feel like I'm in a really, really good spot with KAC. I should also say that I'm also, I'm a, I'm a dad. I have two boys, a, a six-year-old and a 10-year-old. And my wife and I live here in Lawrence, Kansas. Um, and so I have like a personal connection to these issues as well. Uh, so uh, uh, a little bit about Kansas Action for Children. So we are a, a nonprofit, nonpartisan children's advocacy organization. And we've been around for over 43 years now. And we were created by um, several uh, local uh, organizations in the Topeka area. It was the, the junior leagues that came together along with the Kansas Children's Services League. Uh, they came together because they realized there was no independent voice for children in the state house. There were lots of organizations that were um, interested in children's issues, but because they might've received funding from the state or they had other contracts, it, it became difficult for them to speak out uh, on certain issues. So they created Kansas Action for Children uh, to have that independence and so that we, we can say and do the things that need to be said and done for children and families. So um, we are the, the people we are serving that we show up for every day are our kids in Kansas. For, for many years, it was kind of that the birth to, to five, birth to eight space, but we are really now, uh, we've expanded our, our, our view and our, our showing up for kids really zero to 24. Um, because there are so many supports that are necessary, not only early in, in, a, in the child's life, but as people um, become young adults and become young parents, uh, they still need supports and the state government plays an important role in, in providing those supports. Um, so we, we have, we have uh, decades of experience working in and around the state house in Topeka. Uh, and I think the Kansas Action for Children of today though, looks quite a bit different than it has in even in the most recent years. Uh, we, we essentially do three things. We, first and foremost, we are um, a resource to lawmakers. We make sure that elected officials in, in the legislature uh, understand the needs of kids and families and prioritize those needs in their policy decisions. And so we do that by providing them with uh, data and insights about the well-being of children in their districts. We do that by reviewing uh, policies and legislation that they propose and helping them understand their impacts on children. And then we, we elevate the needs of our partners around the state who, uh, who are working directly with children and families and so that they can understand what those experiences are. So first and foremost, we, we, we make sure law, lawmakers understand those needs of children and families. Second is we are a resource to partner organizations around the state, many of whom provide direct services to kids and families, but who don't have an ability to be in the state house uh, to monitor what's going on and get into the nitty gritty of policymaking. So we see our role as being the eyes and ears in the state house, trying to shape the hearts and minds of those in the state house. And we get what's happening and we make sense of it. And we get that out to our network of partners like you all, um, so, that, um, so that our partners can uh, mobilize their base and activate their base to put pressure on lawmakers to do the right things. And importantly, uh, our network of partners informs what we do in the state house because we wanna make sure that the needs of Kansans around the state are being heard in, in, in the state house. Uh, and I'll, this might, might sound like a shocker to you all, but uh, there, there are times when lawmakers don't listen to what their, what their constituents are saying or, or they uh, ignore segments of the population. Uh, and we want to make sure that no child gets overlooked uh, by uh, lawmakers. And we have uh, too long of a history of that happening, especially for uh, children who are experiencing poverty, children who are growing up with limited opportunity, and children who uh, come from communities of color uh, and, who are, and who are children of color. Uh, they've been ignored too long. And the final thing that we do is we try to foster uh, collaboration and policy innovation across the state. So when I'm in Pittsburgh touring the Family Resource Center, a, a spectacular childcare center, and they're doing cool things about family engagement, I'll tell my friends in Liberal about what's happening. Or if, uh, if Garden City contacts us about childcare challenges or access to health insurance, and they may need advice on how to handle it at the local level, we can put them in touch with Lawrence. 
So uh, it, what's really important is, is realizing that uh, to do this work is really collective work. It takes a network of organizations and it takes constant communication about what's working, what's not, and, and who can do what. Um, so those are the th three things that we do. And uh, there are lots of like tactics that we will use to, to, to support that work, but that, that's the easiest way to understand uh, Kansas Action for Children's work. So I mentioned we show up for kids and families every day, but our, our primary audience is actually elected officials. So the 125 House members and the 40 senators uh, are, are who we prioritize, uh, obviously along with working with the governor and state agencies. Um, and uh, we have a small and mighty team, 12 staff, uh, 10 of us are registered lobbyists and we focus on uh, uh, the state house during the session from January until roughly uh, May or June. And um, what I am really proud of uh, is that we have as many lobbyists in the building, I think now as AT&T or any other large corporation. The difference is we're showing up uh, for our constituency of children and, and the people who care for children. And I'm really proud of that. And we are able, through this staffing model that we have, we're able to monitor, I think, over 115 hours of legislative activity every week. And we show up to uh, the committees that are relevant to the health and well-being of children, which, as it turns out, is quite a few committees uh, because lots of issues impact young people and, and the people who care for them. So we are in health committees. We are in the uh, foster care and, and the, the new welfare reform committee. We're in the appropriations committee for budget work. We focus on tax policy to make sure that no foolish decisions are made to dry up revenue and put us back into a budget crisis. We show up in the agriculture committee because of uh, uh, important programs uh, that make sure that families have food. So we're in a lot of different places. And uh, so this is like our prime time of, of being involved in the legislature. And as I mentioned, we try to be a resource for lawmakers. So relationship building uh, uh, across the aisle is really important to us because we believe that um, it's difficult to uh, make asks of policymakers unless they trust us and they understand uh, who, we're, who we're representing and they understand how they can use their, their votes and their voices to make a difference. So we're, we are in and out of legislator offices all the time. And as I mentioned, it, um, we don't just hold on to that information. We try to take what we learn and provide it to our partners at the right time in the right format with the right call to action so that, that uh, all of us can do something about what's happening in the state house and not feel helpless. Uh, so that's our work. I'm gonna pause there to see if anybody has any questions about what we do or uh, who, who we show up for. None yet? Not yet. Okay, that's no problem. I'll keep talking. I'm going to take a quick uh, water break, though. Um, one second. So um, I hope I'm not in. I, I, I hope I'm not in a room with a uh, with like um, brain scientists or um, folks who know a lot more than me about early childhood development. But I think it's important to touch on uh, why why we have this focus on children. You, you know. I don't think we necessarily need a reason. Like, I think it's important to make sure kids are well taken care of. Uh, and I love, I love my job. I love that I, that I get to do this work, but I also have that frustration of like, uh, do we really need an organization of 12 people who work 40 hours a week to remind lawmakers that children need housing or that um, they, that it's, it's a, a pretty good idea that kids have food or maybe the people that care for kids need health insurance. Like that really frustrates me. And I have to, I have to balance out like, that reality, um, because sadly, uh, we need to remind people of that. And there is, a, as you all are well aware, there is a kind of ideology that exists in the state house where, where uh, it, uh, you really have to staunchly defend the need for families to have support to make ends meet. And you need to push back on people making policy decisions for thousands of Kansans based off anecdotes or this uh, you know, confirmation bias about people in poverty or something like that. But I think what we are telling lawmakers uh, is beginning to resonate, but there's a lot more work that has to be done by us and our partners to, to break through. But the, the, our, we are oriented to uh, uh, around a belief that uh, 
children and children don't just need one thing to grow up healthy and to thrive. They need lots of things. And I like to think of it kind of like the difference between a recipe and a menu. If you want to order something off the menu, you can order one thing and be done. But if you want to make a recipe, say you want to make a cake, you need all those ingredients for that cake to turn out exactly like you want it to. And while you might be able to have something that kind of tastes good and can pass, uh, if you miss an ingredient or two, it's not going to be the same. And so we are, uh, as an organization, are uh, advocating for policies across these areas that make a strong recipe. Uh, so uh, when it comes to issues like health, we are um, helping lawmakers understand that if we invest in programs that uh, allow parents to have health insurance, uh, then they're more likely to enroll their kids in health insurance programs. And when kids can have access to well child visits, they have a stronger start at life. Uh, and we help them understand that the places where, where children and families live, learn and play can have, have a significant impact on their health. It's what's known as the social de determinants of health. And so we help them understand it's not just simply an individual's choices and behaviors, but it's what choices and behaviors they can make given their circumstances. A lot of lawmakers aren't familiar with the decades now of, of research that, that talks about how the environment uh, shapes our health and shapes a number of factors about uh, an individual's ability to make decisions and, and, and have certain behaviors. So um, we also are, we are oriented to try to like, um, to reduce the uh, instances of adverse childhood experiences. Because what we know from decades of brain science is if children are growing up in households with high levels of stress and trauma, uh, then what happens, it can have an actual impact on the, develop the developing brain of children, especially in the earliest years. And that can have lifelong consequences on their health, on their ability to learn, on their ability to um, uh, uh, work. And so we are trying to encourage lawmakers to understand that brain science, understand the lifelong effects of adverse childhood experiences and toxic stress so that they can allocate state resources to programs and services uh, that are targeted towards the, the first years of a child's life and uh, targeted to the uh, parents and caregivers. Because again, infants and toddlers and young children don't raise themselves. They need supportive and nurturing caregivers in their lives and those people need support as well. And that's backed up actually by a recent needs assessment that was done by the Kansas uh, Children's Cabinet Trust Fund that I that I sit on as the Senate Minority Leaders appointee. And we went to all Kansas counties and I think uh, had input from like 6,000 Kansans. And one of the key findings what is, was that Kansans are struggling to have their basic needs met. And so that's something, uh, a message we're sharing with lawmakers. And that's why we are also strong advocates for uh, work and family support programs like cash assistance, or the child care assistance program, or the SNAP food assistance program, largely federally funded programs that are administered by the state. But unfortunately, lawmakers, conservative lawmakers, have put up uh, increase, an increasing number of barriers to families being able to access those programs because of their ideological belief that the government shouldn't be playing a role uh, in these things, or that they create a, a, a lifelong sense of dependency on these programs, when in fact, all of these programs um, play a key role in uh, keeping kids fed, housed, uh, uh, and cared for so that parents can, can show up and be supportive of their children and also show up to work and be um, uh, engaged in their community. So that's why you'll see KAC in a lot of places talking about these federally funded uh, uh, work and family support programs. We're also increasingly showing up in uh, the education space. And for us, education is birth to uh, you know, graduation from high school. And uh, we are helping lawmakers understand that childcare and early learning is not babysitting. It is brain building and it is an absolutely critical component uh, to uh, children's lifelong success uh, and certainly helps them prepare, prepares them for, for kindergarten and beyond. So we are working to um, uh, remind lawmakers of that and to uh, um, start to identify state resources to make childcare more affordable because right now childcare is uh, terribly expensive and we are now in this position where uh, providers can't afford to make less and parents can't afford to pay more. Um, and uh, what needs to happen uh, to, to, to bridge that gap is that we need to use more state and federal dollars to subsidize childcare. 
Um, and um, spoiler alert, there's a lot of lawmakers, conservative lawmakers that don't love the idea of increased investments to support childcare affordability, yet nearly all of them have been talking about the childcare crisis, crisis in their districts and businesses in their community and large employers in their communities have been saying childcare is a crisis. And what is uh, happening right now is conservative lawmakers are saying it's regulations that is the problem for child care. Uh, and the, their first uh, uh, and maybe only solution right now is to deregulate child care, uh, which uh, will do nothing but jeopardize the health and safety of children uh, in, in care. So um, we have a lot of work to do to, to strengthen our child care system in Kansas, and it's going to take an all of the above approach. Yes, we might be able to look at um, modest tweaks to regulations that might make it hard to repurpose spaces for child care. But we also need state funding. We need federal funding. We might need local dollars. Uh, and we need to better coordinate our uh, early childhood programs, which are currently spread spread across four different state agencies, which is why I applaud the governor and her plans to create a task force to explore the cre creation of one central agency focused on uh, early childhood. So uh, child care, early learning issues, uh, all super important to us. And then for the first time K in a long time, I think KAC is also gonna get, get involved in K-12 education, not necessarily from the like finance formula school funding perspective, but more so for, uh, just making sure that the decisions that are being made by state policymakers have the best interest of the child in mind. And, uh, and so what, that's why we're joining with uh, other education partners to push back on this so-called Parents' Bill of Rights and any efforts to not teach the truth about our country's history um, and to uh, exclude uh, women from uh, uh, transgender, women, transgender youth and women from participating in sports. So uh, the education battles are taking different shape. We aren't the lead on them, but we are, we are lending our, our capacity to support our partners in that area more so than we, than we have in, in recent years. So we've talked about health, but I, I guess I haven't gotten in depth on some of the health things. Let me, let me explain some of the health things. Uh, we still have not expanded Medicaid, which is our health insurance program for families living on low incomes in Kansas. And we absolutely support Medicaid expansion. And we continue to work with the Alliance for a Healthy Kansas on expansion uh, proposals and getting lawmakers to support it. But it's a, it's a heavy lift uh, and has been for a while. And I think it's gotten heavier because the current Speaker of the House, uh, who appoints all the committee chairs, uh, is Dan Hawkins out of Wichita. And he is not a big fan of expansion. Um, so uh, absent Medicaid expansion and all the uh, like economic and health benefits that would result from that, uh, we are working on some other smaller issues that may be less visible, but I think are really important. One is uh, Kansas is the only state in the country to tie eligibility for the children's health insurance program to a specific year in statute. So in this case, uh, it's tied to the 2008 federal poverty limit. And that, that was a long time ago and uh, a lot less inflation ago. And so now fewer and fewer kids are eligible for the Children's Health Insurance Program because of one word in statute. And we've been trying for now it's our second year to get that one word removed. But the problem is uh, leadership has been afraid to run any bill that mentions health insurance because it's germane to a Medicaid expansion amendment. And they didn't want to be on the record having a vote against Medicaid expansion again because it's not a super defensible position. Um, so we're working on that. We're also trying to um, increase the, the, the current budget cap on the newborn screening program. So in Kansas, when every baby is born, they go through a battery of tests uh, through a screening program at no cost to the parents. The state covers those costs. And as new tests have become available, it's just added more cost to the program. And we keep running into the cap on that. And we've been advocating to eliminate that cap or um, uh, at least increase the cap. Again, same challenge exists on that. Uh, it, it is germane to Medicaid expansion, so lawmakers have not wanted to put forward a permanent fix to that. Um, we also, uh, this is, I think, relevant to you all, given some of your representation. We have to fight back against, like, awful uh, anti-vaccination policy. Um, and thankfully, we got through last legislative session with no substantive changes to childhood immunization schedules um, or any really awful vaccine policy, but that's gonna continue to come. And you know, 
Senator Stefan and Senator Thompson have introduced a bill that is just wild. I mean, eliminating vaccination requirements for child care centers and settings. Like just the stuff that it's not just COVID, it's it's all kinds of illnesses. And so uh, I, I hope that there is enough, there are enough reasonable senators to, to stop that in the Senate. But if not, I, I think that the, the House leadership doesn't really have a lot of appetite for some of those proposals. So where, where we've gone, we've talked health insurance, we've talked uh, vaccination policy, we've talked education policy, uh, economic family support programs. Last up, I, I think would be uh, fiscal policy, budget and tax proposals. And, you know, I got to say, I have uh, I remember Women for Kansas's role in uh, uh, elevating the, 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 the dire consequences of the Brownback tax experiment and the role that you all have pl played in, in keeping the, the issue alive until it was finally repealed back in 2017 uh, with a bipartisan effort. And if you recall uh, from, from back in the day in those terrible times, that Brownback tax experiment was about a, like a billion dollar um, loss in revenue, which led to credit downgrades and cuts to programs and just like scrounging through the couch cushions of the state general fund to find money to pay for things. And uh, so we repealed it. And then uh, shocker, uh, revenue started coming back in to the point now, uh, of course, some of this has some federal funding in it, but to now if, if, if nothing dramatic happens with the budget process this year, we'll end this fiscal year, so June 30th, with likely a roughly $2 billion budget surplus. And then again, if nothing dramatic happens, then next fiscal year, 2024, uh, would would uh, end with a roughly three billion dollar budget surplus. So that's a that's a really great position to be in, and that wouldn't have happened without comprehensive tax reform and repealing the Brownback tax experiment. But as the song goes, with more money might come more problems, and those problems arise in the form of conservative lawmakers wanting to cut taxes because of look at all this money. And what's frustrating uh, is that. Uh, as they're looking at massive cuts and depending on the proposal that's put out, they could rival the Brownback tax experiment in their, their cost. Um, that's what they want to do. And they, which implies, I think, uh, that they think college is completely affordable and no money needs to be put towards higher education. It implies that, that there's no real problem with childcare and the state doesn't need to put any more money towards it to help it be more affordable for parents. It implies that they're fine with a waiting list for the Medicaid waiver program for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities being years long, and, and they're okay with that. There is money now to make significant investments in places we haven't been able to, and yet lawmakers are prioritizing tax cuts that are going to disproportionately benefit uh, wealthy individuals and corporations, many of which are out of state. And I don't like that idea. I think we still have a lot of more investment we can do in families living on low incomes and, and middle income households. That could be investments in the budget, but also could be targeted uh, and sustainable uh, tax changes, like the, the complete elimination of the food sales tax on the statewide sales tax on groceries uh, and, the, and the addition of period products and diapers. It could also be um, addressing property taxes. Uh, it could be making the current homestead property tax uh, credit uh, applicable to renters, which it's currently not. It could be lots of different things that are targeted uh, to a specific uh, uh, group of people who need it instead of more giveaways that are gonna increase income inequality. Um, it could be used to uh, create a state level paid family medical leave program uh, to help uh, uh, moms and dads care for their newborns or uh, adopted kids or, or other uh, kind of medical uh, uh, situations. But these aren't ideas that, that conservative Republicans are elevating. They are elevating the need for continued cuts in taxes. And so that's really challenging. Um, uh, so I feel like I've rambled for a little bit uh, and I can't see if anybody's no nodding off or uh, maybe you're angry uh, and I can't see that either. Uh, so can we pause? And I'd love to have anybody ask questions. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, there we go. Okay. So I heard you talk about ACEs and I know what they are. 
but I don't know if everybody in the room knows what they are. So maybe you could tell us what it is and or what they are and how you can measure those. Sure, great question. And I am not going to do it justice, but ACEs are adverse childhood experiences. And uh, uh, I think it was based off of studies uh, from Kaiser Permanente uh, uh, several decades ago. But it, um, children in, in their life, all of us uh, have, have, may, may have had uh, something that counts as an adverse childhood experience. It could be things like divorce. It could be an incarcerated parent. It could be assault, sexual trauma. Other things are these, are these instances, these kind of episodic things or uh, uh, situations in our lives that, uh, that uh, many of us can bounce back from because we develop resilience to those um, adverse child experiences. But if they come quickly or if they just get stacked on, I think the research has shown that, you know, if you have X amount of adverse childhood experiences, the likelihood of negative health outcomes significantly increases. And this could be physiological and ne negative health outcomes like heart disease, uh, diabetes, other other issues. But it could also be, uh, men you know, mental health issues. Um, so our goal, I mean, uh, uh, child advocates, our goal is to reduce uh, instances of adverse child experiences. And because you might have ACEs doesn't mean, you know, it's a life sentence. There are, there, there are uh, activities and programs and services to help people uh, mitigate those um, and develop that resilience. But that's, that's the, the, the basic understanding of adverse child exper experiences. And then the, the kind of related issue is, is toxic stress and Research has, has shown that when 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 young kids are exposed to repeated high levels of stress, there the cortisol cortisol in their bodies just uh, stays at a heightened level. Your fight or flight con um, uh, uh, hormones kick in and just stay kicked in, and that actually can begin to develop the 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 the, the, the wiring of the brain for very young children. And so again, doesn't mean necessarily permanent, but it becomes harder and more expensive. Uh, and complex to address kind of later on rather than just trying to prevent toxic levels of stress in households. And that stress is created by lots of different factors, but uh, a lot of it uh, uh, can be related to economic factors, just the anxiety and stress and, and, and uh, related things that come about when you don't know how to make your household work because uh, of, of there's no good options. And this has a relation to the foster care crisis that our state is, is in, when we see uh, uh, huge increases in children entering the foster care system, a lot of that has to do with neglect. Uh, there, you know, certainly there can be abuse, but a lot of it has to do with neglect. And uh, when we look at causes for neglect, uh, a lot of the times what we're seeing is uh, uh, households or, or parents who have to make terrible choices. Do I take the shift at work to, to, to have income and leave my child with a neighbor I don't uh, know that well? Do you leave the child home by themselves so you can uh, 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 go to work or care for an ailing family member, whatever it might be? And these instances just lead to unfortunate outcomes. Um, and we end up spending an enormous amount of money uh, to care for kids in the foster care system when I think we could spend less money um, providing programs and services to help families meet their basic needs uh, so that um, they don't have to make those terrible choices that, that lead to then interaction with the child welfare system. Uh, and in fact, there's a researcher out of KU, Donna Ginther, that, that did a study on the decrease in access to TANF, which is the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families Program. It's cash assistance, um, decrease in TANF, and the increase in uh, out-of-home placements uh, in the foster care system. Uh, and, and, and again, that's more work we're trying to do to educate lawmakers that... Um, there are very real consequences when you restrict access to the safety net in Kansas. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Yes. Good. Time delay here. Um, I do know from doing ACEs tests, it's a really quick, easy test. It's 10 questions, you can Google it, and you it's 10 yes or no questions and you answer. And that gives you, for every yes, that gives you your your ACEs score, which like John said, is not a death sentence because it can be worked around. Um, gosh, I wish Shirley was here, Muncie and some of the other ladies who are um, psychologists and social workers and they know these things. I have a boss who had six 
aces and she's the most zen person you'll ever meet in your life but she had some pretty adverse childhood experiences i i encourage you to google it and see um i also learned that it um too many piled on can lead to um being passed through your DNA changes your DNA. So we want to make sure that our poor little kids are, are being kept from those. Anybody else have some questions for John? Hang on. You mentioned four agencies that the child care system is currently under. What are those four agencies? Good question. Uh, so we have the Kansas Department for Health and Environment, KDHE. They handle health and safety, so like licensure, uh, and there are what, roughly 4,500 or so licensed child care providers in Kansas. So KDHE, license, uh, health and safety and licensure. Then you have the Department for Children and Families, DCF. They run the child care subsidy program that helps families on low incomes afford child care. Um, they also run what's called the QRIS, the Quality Rating Improvement System. That's kind of like, what I call it like Yelp for childcare. The goal would be providers um, are on this kind of uh, uh, plan to improve quality, which might include the, the environment itself, but also credentials of, of uh, early childhood educators. And so the higher, the goal of a QRIS, which we don't yet have a functioning statewide QRIS, the goal is to increase quality uh, for better outcomes for children and for parents to, to, to understand, oh, I should look for the highest quality child care possible that's convenient to my work and my house. So DCF does subsidy and the QRIS. Then you have the Department for Education, Kansas Department of Education. They run what's called the CACFP, the Child and Adult Care Food Program. So that's um, like snacks, subsidized snacks at uh, child care uh, facilities. And they also have the three and four-year-old at-risk uh, uh, program uh, for uh, school-based pre-K. Um, then there is the, the Kansas Children's Cabinet and Trust Fund. As I mentioned, I'm a member of that. The Kansas Children's Cabinet and Trust Fund was established in the early 90s when lawmakers, when, when states sued Big Tobacco because of the health care costs that they were assuming because of smokers using their products, Kansas made the, an amazing decision to dedicate all those, uh, all that, the future payments from the, from the settlement to early childhood programs and evidence-based early childhood interventions. So every year, Kansas receives, it fluctuates depending on the number of people smoking, um, like 54 to $60 million to dedicate towards early childhood programming. Um, and that's rigorously evaluated uh, uh, programming. Uh, so, so that's the other source of, of, of those four agencies. And the task force that was the first executive order that Governor Kelly signed, the intent is to pull it together this spring and it comes up with how to transition to a single agency by, by January is when they'll submit those recommendations. Does that answer your question? Yes, Great. hang on a second. Um, can you kind of highlight like all that many, the what did you say, billions that we get a year? Where does that go particularly? Does it go into daycare? Does it go into health? Where's, what's it going into? Good question. So for the Children's Initiative Fund and that tobacco settlement, this tobacco settlement dollars, it's only about 60, 50, 54 to $60 million on average. And so about, about 19 million of that is, goes towards what's called the Early Childhood Block Grant. And that's where it goes to the community level to programs like what stands out is in Pittsburgh, it's a Family Resource Center. Uh, it might go to the Russell Child Development Center in Garden City. It goes to home visiting programs, other things. So um, that $60 million is um, uh, kind of allocated based on recommendations from the Children's Cabinet that then the legislature just has to, to implement. So it's about 60 million a year. What's interesting and frustrating is if it weren't for smokers, then there's essentially zero state dollars uh, going towards early childhood programming or child care. I mentioned the child care assistance program, the child care subsidy that is that's kind of it's loaded on the same card that a family might use for SNAP at the grocery store or food assistance. Um, 
all almost all of that money is federally funded uh and the state has has to put a portion of its dollars to like to match a, a portion of that funding so uh any money that is like uh designated for for child care early learning is just really state match to draw down federal funds again if people stop smoking and that money dried up uh, law, lawmakers aren't really putting anything towards making child care more affordable which is very frustrating and i so so i i don't know if i mentioned it but like uh and i don't know if you all have had direct experience with it or have children or grandchildren um who have experience with this but Child care is expensive. My wife and I, so I have a six-year-old and a 10-year-old. My six-year-old is finishing up his last year in his program. And this last year, he he was at a, at a Montessori program because they were the best at masking. But prior to that was a family child care uh, setting. Uh, my kids didn't go to fancy child care. And uh, we, we will have spent close to $100,000 on child care uh, for, for two boys uh, in modest child care in Lawrence, Kansas. Um, and you think about families who, who, um, who are just getting started and they might have college debt because the state hasn't invested in higher education in a long time. Um, so they have student loans uh, in Can actually not even in Kansas. Um, there's no county in the United States anymore where you could afford housing or rent on minimum wage. And Kansas's minimum wage is seven twenty-five in an hour. Or so even working full-time on minimum wage in Kansas, people still qualify for the food assistance program. So uh, it's not great. So back to the point, childcare, very expensive, uh, um, especially infant care. And there's like 22 counties now in Kansas where uh, there's not even a single spot available for infants. So when, when, when you hear conservatives say, the problem is nobody wants to work, that's not true. Uh, the, the, the vast majority of people want to work. But the question is, if they have children, do they have a safe, affordable place for them to, to spend their days? And it's a good chance that they don't. Another challenge, um, I feel like I'm all challenges today. There's good news somewhere in all of this. Uh, the other challenge is uh, not every child care provider accepts the child care subsidy program or the, you know, the card to pay for it. Um, because uh, they, they oftentimes, uh, the family can't pay the difference between what the subsidy is and what the rate that the provider pays. So the provider ends up losing money. So they've decided just to stop accepting it. So that's a real challenge because the parent might have it, but they can't find a convenient provider that meets their needs. Um, or uh, parents might work the third shift at a manufacturing facility and there's just no provider that's open overnight. Um, and so again, these are all things that the legislature could take that two billion dollar surplus and invest in. We're gonna we're gonna uh, provide a direct payment to every licensed childcare provider. We're gonna specifically build facilities and incentivize third shift coverage. We're gonna incentivize uh, providers uh, who provide who provide care in Spanish for families that need it. But they don't. They want to just deregulate. And, and an instance of that last year, lawmakers uh, actually it was uh, coming out of the Senate Leadership Office. Um, they wanted to change child care uh, regulations to change the ratios. And the ratios are the number of adults to children. And uh, the proposal that was put out there, uh, like floated out there, was uh, 18 infants to one adult. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, that is that ha that uh, uh, if it wasn't written by uh, somebody who's never uh, had to change a diaper or hold a bottle or anything, then I'd be shocked because, uh, I mean, just the wildest ideas. And we already know from working very closely with child care providers, uh, there's been an effort to change it from one to three infants, which is the current ratio, to one to four. And already providers are like, you you might change that, but we're not going to, we're not going to add another child. Like caring for three infants is enough. So again, these are the, these are the proposals or, or letting 14-year-olds uh, work in child care facilities, uh, which is not a solution because as far as I know, like 14 year olds should be enrolled in, in school um, and not caring for, for kids because you, you're not paying well. Because providers, uh, as I mentioned, it, it's, it's so expensive for, for childcare, but a lot of providers in Kansas can make more money working at Menards or Quick Trip or Target or wherever it is than they can working from seven in the morning till six at night, changing diapers and managing children. Um, that's the reality right now. And they often don't have vacation or health insurance. They would be uh, among the, the population that would 
definitely benefit from health insurance from Medicaid expansion. You can see it's a lot simpler to just say, let's just deregulate, right? Yeah. And you don't have to address the complexity of it. A question came up, what can we do to help you? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, well, so uh, K I, I, I love the team at KAC. As I mentioned, 12 people. And I think, I think we're a charming bunch where we, we, we sound smart oftentimes and we have good relationship with lawmakers, but we're only 12 people uh, uh, in, in Topeka. And oftentimes lawmakers like to listen to people in their districts more than they like to listen to lobbyists. Um, so we realize that uh, we can only be so effective. And I like to think of um, how we work kind of like being at a potluck. Like what we bring to the potluck is understanding how 165 lawmakers think and act and the ability to know what the process is like and all that, that's our dish. Um, but we need other people to bring their dishes to the, to the, um, to the potluck. And those dishes look like uh, uh, voter registration and making sure there are more eligible voters who, who are paying attention to issues and who can be mobilized to contact lawmakers during session to contact lawmakers while they're campaigning for re-election, uh, and then to show up and vote in ways that align with the values of, of people who want the best things for kids and families. So I think uh, what you can do to help is uh, make sure you're registered to vote, make sure you're encouraging other people to register to vote, make sure you're turning out people who care about kids uh, uh, to vote, and uh, not letting um, people silo issues and say, well, I don't really love politics. I just, I just really care about kids in the foster care system. We have to, uh, or saying like, I don't really care about taxes. I, I care about health insurance. All of these issues are interconnected when it comes to the health and well-being of children. And so we have to get past our aversion to certain policy areas because we may not feel like experts. The reality is lawmakers are not even experts. They rely on the wisdom of other people. Uh, a lot of a lot of times they're lobbyists. A, a lot of times they're just people who sit next to them on the floor and they've come to vote the way that they do. Uh, but I think um, reminding people of how all these issues are connected and not not um, not siloing them is a really important thing to do. Um, I need to I need to keep this uh, C three compliant. But I would just say uh, uh, pay attention to what your lawmate your local delegation is doing. Uh, you have, let's see, you, so Reno County, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, so Jason Probst and uh, Mark Steffen and uh, Paul Wagner. Paul Wagner. Paul Wagner. Um, left. Who? Yeah. Michael Murphy. That's right. Joe Seiwert. Oh, Joe Seiwert. Okay. Pretty Prairie, right? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think what's important is that none of them get a free pass because I think so I can speak from experience as a lawmaker it's I, well, I witnessed a lot of people kind of treating the legislative session like it was the equivalent of summer camp like I'm going to get out of town um, maybe I can put my business down for a little bit and go go to Topeka I'm going to be there and uh, very few people from my district can ever make it over to see what I'm doing or to hear what I'm saying and they, they uh, oftentimes uh, can filter what they report back to their district through the newsletters or through their coffees or whatever, who they choose to meet with. And so I don't think, I don't think lawmakers sometimes give the full picture of what they're saying and doing. And so we're trying to do a better job of highlighting what lawmakers are saying and doing and getting that information to people back in districts so that they could say, you know, I don't really like the way you talk about poor families. I don't really like the condescending tone that you take about people who use uh, government programs uh, and and not let them get free passes on those things. Um, and, you know, I think when you can show up to the Capitol, like you have every right to be in that building. It is the people's house, uh, people's building, and it can be intimidating. I think it's because it's the legislative process is designed to be intimidating, keep those in power in power. Um, but uh, remember that nobody up there is an expert on everything, and um, and 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 there are processes in place to to kind of um, uh, 
maybe stifle certain ideas, but, but don't hesitate to get over there and share your ideas. We have a newsletter too that you could sign up for. You just go to kac.org and you can, uh, at the top of the page is a way to join our newsletter. And we provide weekly legislative summaries about what's happening in the Capitol uh, through the lens of kids and families. And we try to break it down into those areas I mentioned, fiscal policy, health, education, and economic security so that you can get a snapshot of what's happening. And we try to, we try to make it really relatable so you don't have to know the acronyms or the slogans or things like that. Uh, so I would highly recommend that and you forward that to as many people as possible. You'll sound smart and you'll look smart. Um, uh, and I'd also say run for office too. Uh, don't hesitate to run for office. It's intimidating, and uh, but it's also a great way to uh, uh, make larger changes to your community and to, to others around the state than simply direct service might provide if you volunteer somewhere. Um, there are other things too. I mean, certainly I don't mind if, if people donate to KAC. I, I would love support for our work, but I also... Um, and we are we are fortunate to have support from a number of Kansas-based foundations and national foundations. And so, uh, if your choice is to, to to donate to us or to donate to a local group that is really helping meet the immediate needs of families and kids in your communities, I would highlight that instead because they likely uh, don't have the same uh, uh, support from foundations that we do. Like the United Methodist Ministries Health Fund is one of our funders. Other questions or questions about, yeah, the legislative process or like, uh, you know, things you've heard and is it true or whatever. You can ask me anything and you can shut me down whenever I need to also. Hang on. I just I just have a question going back to the child care thing. Um, is there a role for the employer in helping this child care thing? Because ultimately they're the beneficiary if they're able to get more people to come work for them. So it seems like there should be a role they're playing in helping making, helping to make this easier for families. I has agree. That, yeah. Has that been explored or looked at? It has. There's been a number of, uh, it's mainly on the local level, less on the state level, but where you have these public-private partnerships that exist, or you might have uh, the chamber act as a um, kind of a, uh, an organizing entity for businesses to, to, to funnel uh, funds through, or you might find a community foundation that businesses give to. So I, I think one of the, the, the hardest way for businesses to support the childcare uh, issue is to create their own centers or do it on site. I mean, it may make sense for some large employers, but like that is a very expensive and costly way to do it um, rather than maybe find ways that the businesses contribute to an existing center or maybe uh, contribute money to, to build a new center. And then what, what, what we see, arrangements we see is they, they subsidize so many slots that are made available to the uh, kids of their employees. So, so they don't really have it on site, but they're subsidizing a program somewhere else. Um, we did work last year with Republicans and Democrats to develop a tax credit for businesses that help employees find childcare or pay for childcare or create a childcare center on, uh, within their company, uh, but that's only a $3 million tax credit for, uh, for each fiscal year for uh, total. So multiple businesses could, could, could apply for it and that goes pretty quickly. But yes, employers play a role. You'll hear the term in the, in the kind of early learning space of like uh, of blending and braiding funding. So we need to blend and braid federal dollars, state dollars, children's initiative fund dollars, Family, you know, family share of it, and then private, don't private business dollars, um, and and do the coordination at the state level, so that the so that there is less hassle and work for families and businesses at the local level. Other questions. I, you know, I I, re I realize I didn't really talk. This may be old news to you all, but like. Yeah, if, if anybody had any questions about just the general process of the legislature, I'm happy to provide the, the Schoolhouse Rocks version of that without the singing. We've got quite a few people who have run for office sitting in here, so good. we're pretty good. Yeah, yeah okay, good. Right. Anybody else have any other questions? Nope. Would you like to go have dinner with your family? 
I, you, you read my mind. I haven't had dinner, but I'm actually excited. We're reading my, my son, my 10 year old and I were reading the sequel to the book hatchet by Gary Paulson. So I get to do bedtime story tonight. I alternate my six year old, and my 10 year old every other night. And so it's story time night, uh, reading, reading Brian's winter, I think is what it's called. So, okay. yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing an hour with us. We sure appreciate what you had to say. It flew by, and I'm so glad uh, that you all invited me. And if you ever want to have me again or any of my colleagues, you just don't hesitate to reach out. We'll do that. Thank you so much. All right. Take care.